My name is Mitch Weisberg, and I'm here for EdChat Interactive um, to welcome you and to advance the slides and to make the introduction. Uh, tonight, we're going to hear from Lee Watanabe Crockett and Andrew Churches, and they're going to be talking about or having leading a discussion with you all on why should we ban cell phones is not the right question. Now, as I often do with EdChat Interactive, I'd like to introduce you a little bit to EdChat Interactive itself. I'm going to expand this uh, so you can read it. Um, our whole purpose in, in bringing you EdChat Interactive is to take what educators are doing and allow them to share them with other educators, but in a format that's much more conducive to learning than a typical webinar. So uh, you're going to be encouraged during the session to interact, to reflect, and to participate. And so we'd like you to we'd like to explain how we do that, um, and we're doing that through a um, a platform called Shindig. Now, as you're uh, as um, you look at the bottom of your screen, you see that there's some buttons there. There's a text chat button. There's an ask question button. Um, there's a raise hand button, and there's a mute mic button. Now the raise hand button, you're going to click that if you want to come up to stage or if we say we'd like a volunteer to come up to stage to uh, to talk with Lee or with Andrew. And if you're willing to do that, you'll click the raise hand button and we'll we'll bring you up. The ask question button is, is allows you to ask a question of me and then I could pass that question to Lee and Andrew also. Um, there's a mute mic button. Um, if you're getting some feedback on your speakers, you can temporarily mute your mic and then and then unmute it. And then there's the text chat button, and that allows you to talk to each other and also talk to Lee and Andrew. So, um, so I'd like you to click that text chat button, and you'll get a uh, dialog box like like what's shown here on the screen. I'll I'll shrink this so you so you have to see it a little bit. You have a little bit more room. Now you can drag it. Um, you can you can move it off the slides if you want to, and on the lower right hand corner is something that allows you to size it as well, and then there's an X on the top right that allows you to close it. But for right now, I'd like you to, to have it open, and I'd like you to introduce yourself to the other people who are here. Just uh, type in where are you from, um, and what are you hoping to learn here learn here tonight, and uh, text and and you know feel free to respond to other people as well. So those are the first few ways of interacting. There's the, as I mentioned, there's the raise hand button, which allows you to come up on stage, ask a question, text chat, and then, um, and then the, the reason why we really thought that, that Shindig creates kind of a revolutionary experience online is the ability of you to be able to have uh, small group discussions with each other. So you can click on the avatar of another person or of a group of people, and then um, and, and then you can have a conversation with them. So I'd like to en encourage you to, to try that right now. I'd like you to click on somebody's avatar and introduce yourself and talk to each other about what you hope to learn. So, um, so go ahead and try that, and I'm going to give you uh, a minute or two to, to try that out. Um, and I'm going to bring myself down and I'll, and I'll come back up in a minute. Okay. Um, I, I, I see a number of you have, have had a chance to talk to each other. Um, and we're, we're, we're going to be doing that a few times during the course of the evening. I'd also like to say we have coming up on November 29th, uh, Angela Myers is going to do a session on You Matter and the world needs your contribution. And then the next night, we're going to have Peter Kraft, who are talking about uh, parents and community. Are they allies or are they frenemies of, of schools? And so, uh, you know, it, it's always helpful if we can get parents to align with what the schools are doing and schools to align with the way parents want their, their, their kids brought up. But you need communication for that to happen. So he's going to be talking about how we can use different tools in order to unite schools and parents together to make the whole childhood experience more meaningful for the kids. So with that said, let me bring up uh, Lee first and, and Andrew second. Uh, Andrew's coming to us from uh, New Zealand and we seem to be having some communications problems because he, uh, he can talk, but he can't hear. So uh, let me bring Lee up first. 
Hello. Oh, so <laughs> hi. So I just want to bring you up so that you can, you, you know, so that you can, you know, say hi to everybody. And I'm going to bring Andrew up also. Hi, everyone. How are we? I'm presuming that so, um, everybody can hear me because I can't hear any feedback here at the moment. Maybe it's because I'm so far away in New Zealand. Okay. And I'm going to bring myself down now. Thanks for that much. Okay, so we are all up and running and we're ready to go. So welcome along to this evening's um, webinar. My name's Andrew Churches and I'm the Head of Faculty for Technology and Design at Christen School in Albany and Auckland. If we flick onto the next slide, um, you'll see exactly where that is. There's this nice arrow pointing to the top of the North Island, New Zealand. Um, and at the moment, it's... A, beautiful day outside sitting at about 20 or 25 degrees and uh, we're having a really nice time here um, most of the time if you flick onto the next slide for me um, thanks Mitch um, I'm working in the classroom with my senior students and I teach senior information technology computer science and we work in very much a constructivist mode we go along build our computers up, build networks, program, and it's a really enjoyable, fun course where I'm learning as much as my students are. Now, I'll let Lee introduce himself on the next slide. So, Lee, this is yours. So, I'm uh, Lee Watanabe Crockett, and this is actually where I am right now uh, in Vancouver. I'm not always here. Uh, Mitch, if you flip the next slide, it'll show where I, uh, where I normally live. So this is this is kind of home for me. Uh, about 200 days a year, uh, flying around the world and and speaking and working in a dozen countries. So uh, I work with uh, with schools, with systems, uh, and the state and national level as well in uh, Canada, the U.S., uh, Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, Dubai, uh, and several other several other places. So I, I rack up a lot of frequent flyer miles. That's for sure. Uh, and it gives me a really good opportunity to see how things differ and how things are the same. Uh, in education around the world. Okay, let's slide and on to the next slide then. So the question we have is why should we ban cell phones is not the right question to ask. If we can flick on to the next slide, that would be wonderful. So last night at my school, we had um, Dr. Nicholas Kadaris come and talk to us about Glow Kids. And he went through and he was explaining some of the issues that he's having as a clinical psychologist um, about students and about young people in screen addiction. And he's one of these people who, because I think he's been exposed to so much of the stuff, is actually turning around and saying to people that kids under 10 should not have any exposure to devices at all. They should have no screen time. And it concerned me a great deal when I went through and listened to this because actually it's not a particularly balanced approach. It's not well considered or thought out when you're turning around in our world that we're in at the moment and saying, actually, we've got to stop using all of these devices. What we actually need is a more measured approach to it. And it will probably help for us to we're in right now to think about that. So if we can click onto our next slide. We're in an incredibly digital world. We're in a world where our kids are connected all of the time. And our next slide looks at just how far it's come along. We're the World Wide Web, not just the, the internet, which everybody seems to think the World Wide Web is the, the sum total of, but the World Wide Web is the subset of the internet is over 1 billion websites. Now, when it started in 1992, at the end of 1992, there were something like 27 reliable web servers in the world. So the level of growth that we've had in the internet is absolutely phenomenal. And while a lot of the stuff that's out there isn't particularly brilliant, we have a, access to a vast amount of information, a vast amount of research, and an enormous variety of tools that are incredibly beneficial. Most of us, if we think about our daily lives, could not survive without form, some form of connection, whether it's 
just as I do as a teacher, being able to log in, call the role, do the roster, mark who's absent or not, um, but also to communicate with my students to share information with them. We're surrounded, if we can slip onto the next slide, slide Mitch, that'd be great, by smart toys. We have BB-8 here. Now, when you look at this as a, a toy, you go, well, that's pretty cool. But I've taken it a step further and I've taken the, the BB-8 toy in the form of the Sphero Plus and we're using Swift programming language and we're programming these. So this is taking a toy on a screen and adapting it into a way that can be used in a classroom. If we click onto our next screen, the concept of drones and now what you are seeing with drones as a, a, a toy, possibly as a tool for work, these are things that we're adapting into the classroom as well. This is another aspect of my teaching that I'm looking at and we're actually getting my students to program everything from the controllers where they're having to build the controllers out of Arduinos and program those right the way through to actually programming the drones to fly set courses and perform routines. So we're in a very smart world. Um, let's go on to the next slide, Mitch. We're surrounded by smart watches. The next slide will show us we've got smart bands. And these are pretty cool because they're also giving you feedback about your health and the like. Next slide. And of course, we've got our smartphones. And it's incredible what these things can do and what we're able to do with them. Now, one of my colleagues has just purchased the iPhone X, which is our next slide through. Um, he went along and ordered it, um, was told it was going to be a couple of months wait time for it. It arrived two days later. When he went and got this, because he's one of our technicians here at school, he went and compared this to the latest um, iPhone that, uh, sorry, the latest uh, iPad that he's got. And the comparison was, was incredible. This device was incredibly powerful. In fact, when he ran a benchmark test against a MacBook Pro, the phone beat this year's model MacBook Pro. So when we start looking, if we can click on the next slide, Mitch, at the capacity of these things, they're absolutely stunning. I remember when I wouldn't have had a laptop with this amount of capacity. And this is a device that you can hold in your hand. And as you can see from the, the slides here, weighs 174 grams. These are complete personal computers and then some that we're walking around with. Let's go on to our next slide, Mitch. Steve Jobs once said that there's an app for everything and there pretty much is. We know that not all of these are good. Not all of them are useful. Certainly some of the points that people make about them being addictive and time-wasting is correct. You can pretty much find anything to do anything. But if you can go through and find these useful tools within there, you suddenly got something that's incredibly powerful in the form of a computer, but also incredibly useful because of the applications that it has on board. So that raises a question, and, and this is, the, if you like, our next slide. Do we actually need to have in our schools labs of computers, or actually are these devices now getting to the point that they are so powerful that our students don't need to go and access a desktop? They don't need to have a laboratory, and we as teachers don't need to start considering buying labs of gear. Maybe that these are actually an alternative, an alternative that they're providing, they're looking after, and they're using. Our next slide is, is looking at how much um, time the average person, the average teenager, is spending online in a week and using devices. So. In total, in their working or their 
learning week, they're spending 80 hours per week using a device. In our next slide, this is the amount of connected time on average that they're having. So this is actively operating in a connected network environment. So they've gone from 80 hours using the devices to 25 hours per week connected. If we click through to our next slide, the same piece of research that this came from said that actually they're doing four hours of homework on average per week. So I was pretty happy that they'll be doing four hours of homework. It wasn't a bad thing. Let's go to our next slide. If we look at that amount of time that they're spending online and through to the next one, thanks much, and start breaking it down a little bit, this is the activities they're up to. On average in a month, they're sending over 3,000 text messages. With girls, that's our next slide, the number is slightly higher. The record though, for how much per month spent on playing games comes in our next slide, which is a pretty marathon amount of time spent doing this. 228 hours per month. For some of my research that working at school, I actually started to go and have a look at what's happening with social networks and our students and how much time are our students spending online. And I started off because my school goes from kindergarten through to year 13. Um, so if that's K to year 12 for you or grade 12 for you guys, and looking at the, the social networks that my students are on. And we started off with these ones here. So we can click onto the next slide. And we thought, well, these are our main ones that our kids are playing in. We looked at it and said, well, these are the, the, the six big ones that we think that they're playing in. And the first thing I did was I went and had a look at where do they fit in age-wise. So if we can click on the next slide, what you'll see here is that these are the age requirements for the different social applications. At age 13, you have to be 13 years old or higher to use Snapchat, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Instagram, Pinterest, and the like. If you look at 14 years or higher, well, that's LinkedIn. I'm not quite sure why a 14-year-old will be using LinkedIn, but there you go. WhatsApp is 16. And then when we start getting up into uh, slightly more interesting ones, like Tinder is 17. Amigle, which is chat roulette, is 18. The interesting little blue bird at the top is Trade Me, which is our New Zealand equivalent of Amazon. Both Trade Me and Amazon, because it's suddenly dealing with money and that's real, have an age restriction of 18. But all the other ones are much, much younger. Let's click on our next slide. Cool, thank you. Um, what are the things I did for my, my research was to actually look at the entire of my middle and senior school. These are my year seven students. And we went through and had a look at what are our major social media products. And as you can see here from our year seven boys, which is the equivalent of grade six, most of them are on Instagram and a fair number are also on Snapchat. Pinterest, Facebook, Twitter, um, Tumblr, don't rate particularly highly with them. If we now overlay the girls as well, our next slide. We can see that the girls are also making a great deal of use out of Instagram and out of Pinterest and Snapchat as well. And in fact, Facebook doesn't even rate a mention with year seven girls um, because it's not saying that they're interested in or use. Tumblr's got a very small amount of use as well. So when we start looking at our grade six kids, 
uh, my year seven, these are 11 year olds. We were looking at around about 70 to 80% of our kids being online in social media. And that's a large number of kids who are out there interacting in what is often an adult environment and frequently without guidance and support as well. We click onto the next slide. Overall, we can see that Instagram is our major tool for use here. This is what our kids are using most of the time. So we need to be able to provide them with some sort of guidance about what are they doing, where are they going, how are they interacting. Now, that's the world that our kids are operating in. In a number of places, and I know at one stage my school tried it, we can click on the next slide, we tried to ban our cell phones. We tried to turn around and say, this isn't what we want. This isn't how we want our kids working. We're going to ban cell phones. We found it an incredibly frustrating process. We still had kids bringing the cell phones in, but it became something that was underground. It wasn't something that was well managed. We weren't able to give the kids advice because we'd come along and said to them, well, you're not allowed them, so why would we tell you about it? And it really started to pose some problems for with us. We've since changed our approach, but I'd like to know what you guys have in a, as an approach. So we can click on the next slide, Mitch. At your schools, what do you have? Are you sitting at level one? There's no cell phones at all. Level two, not seen or heard. The cell phones come to school, but they're kept in bags. Level three, you can use your cell phone out of a classroom, but you can't bring it into the classroom. Four, limited class use. And often my students are doing some of this where they'll come along and take a photo of a whiteboard so that they can come and use that. They'll take photos of notes, or maybe they'll take a short video when we're out on a field trip. Or are you up to that sort of level five level of extensive class use where you're coming along and you're actively encouraging the kids to record lessons so they can play them back later. You're using the tools that are on the phones. You're inviting people into the classroom. You're getting the kids to call people, maybe call their parents if they're an expert in, in that field, and actually starting to get that really extensive use in there. So if you can use the chat window, and I'm sure that Mitch with a click of a button, they'll be able to put one up for us and just put in what level is your school at? Is it one, two, three, four, or five? The chat button should be in the bottom of your screen. Um, so if you can uh, click it and, um, uh, you know, type in where where you are temporarily, I'll um, we'll increase the size of the slide again so you can see it and then um, decrease it. And uh, let's discuss this in the chat. Um, unfortunately, Andrew uh, can't hear me as I'm, as I'm talking, but Lee, you can, you can hear me, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, and then um, if somebody wants to come up and talk about where their school is with Lee, uh, you click on the raise hand button and I'll, and I'll bring you up. Um, Lee, I'll, I'll come down and, um, uh, you know, I'll let you, uh, I guess, uh, chat or, yeah. or you can repeat what's in the, ch the chat windows. I think, um, I think uh, Mitch, uh, Andrew's kind of got a plan here. He just wants to find out where people are at so that he can uh, give some better feedback on the upcoming slides, and then we're going to break okay. out into that kind of a conversation. Okay. And I'm the one person who can't see any of the chats. Are people filling it out? Good. Good. Okay. Yeah, I'm. I, yeah, I'm seeing all the chats, Mick, uh, uh, Mitch. Though so there's a there's a whole bunch of people. We see we're we're all over the place as far as uh, as where we're at with uh, with the technology usage in the schools, which is to be expected, right? That's what that's the where we are in the U.S. That's probably the where we are in the world, also. 
Uh, it, it, I mean, I, I, we see everything from um, from no usage to blacklisting of the internet to whitelisting of the internet to um, to phones being uh, and any device being transparent. So it's it's all over the place, and and that is and it's more we see it more um, restrictive in the U.S. than we see in most other countries, uh, honestly. But uh, uh, but they're still uh, around the world. It, it varies greatly. Okay. Um, and Andrew is Andrew isn't seeing, so I'm just te texting him um, to advise him how to open up the chat window. So I've got um, a comment here from Rush that it's a level two. What about anybody else? Not applicable in my school, but my daughter's school has strict rules for not using in class. Fair enough. Working for the state, so all over the board. Cool. Intensive laptop use, but limited or nearly no use of um, phones. Cool. So I, I guess what we're seeing here is a fairly much a, a mixture coming through. Um, and there's no really high-end use of these particular tools coming through. Um, I want to jump a little bit aside into a, into a bit of theory, if, if I can. So if we can click on to the, the next slide. Thanks, Mitch. A colleague of mine, Bernadine Porter, was instrumental in developing and, and building on Grappling's technology spectrum. And Grappling's technology spectrum basically comes along and says, well, we have three different levels of technology integration. So the first level, which is our next slide, is literacy use. And this is learning about technology. This is going and exploring the technology itself and thinking about what are we doing with this? How does it work? That sort of thing. A lot of this is the stuff that you'll see with kids, um, particularly when they're first introduced to a product or when they're just learning how to use a new device. You've got to have that foundation of literacy to be able to do anything from there. Our next level is augmentative use. And this is learning with technology. So often this is a like for like replacement where you'll be coming along and you'll say, right, I'm going to go and do something using the technology that I would have done otherwise. And a lot of what we're doing now using things like cell phones or tablets or um, iPads and, and laptops is in fact augmentative use. It's a like for like replacement where we used to write notes by hand. We can now grab our stylus and write onto our tablet and take notes where we used to go through and draw up and write a document. We can do that. We can make movies that we would have normally been doing by grabbing hold of a camera. Well, we can now do that on our phone. Our third level that we're heading for is transformative use. And this is where we can start to look at unlocking the potential of these devices. This is learning through technology. It's being able to do things with technology that you couldn't possibly do otherwise. The best example of this isn't sending emails. It's not making movies or producing documents. It's actually a collaboration. It's being able to go and use these tools to enable collaboration to be able to make contact within the class, beyond the class, and across the planet, pretty much using the stuff that we're doing here. So Shindig's actually a really good example of a transformative tool. It enables us to communicate, even though we're in three or four different countries. So with a lot of what we're trying to do with our phones, and with our other technologies, our screens full stop, is actually get up into this transformative level. And this ability to make contact, to collaborate, to bring everything together is really, really important.
But we do have a couple of hitches with this. Obviously, these devices are wonderful for enabling those connections, but they're also really, really easy to be distracted on. Being able to click into Facebook or jump into Twitter and being taken off on a sidetrack. So one of the most important things for us as teachers, and it's even more critical now when we have things like Glow Kids where people are saying, well, you shouldn't be using these ad devices at all, is that we are actually deliberate and considered in what we do with our use in technology. So if we can click on our next slide. Um, so I've just had Mitch ask a question. Are you going to relate grapplings to SAMR? So SAMR is substitution, augmentation, modification, and then redefinition. And SAMR is a really, really good model. I'd like she like grapplings because it's a little bit easier and more straightforward. Um, but certainly Ruben's work um, in going through and developing SAMR has been absolutely brilliant. It again is a very similar process going through where we're starting with, uh, we're substituting one to one, there's augmentation where we're adding a layer in, there's modification of what you're doing in your activities. But that whole end point is that goal at the end where we're redefining what we're actually doing and whether we call it transformative as in grapplings or the redefinition level for SAMA, um, it is, it's the same sort of thing. We're doing things we couldn't possibly have done in any other way. Okay, can we click through onto our next slide, please? One of the things that um, Lee and I have, have been working on is looking at producing a framework for the students so that they're actually well supported. It's well and good when you're coming along and, and you're putting together a digital citizenship program and you say, well, this is what we need you to do. But actually, you need to provide the students with processes that are really beneficial for them, that they can keep coming back to and use time and time again. So I'm going to flick over to Lee if he's about. Are you there, Lee? Yep, I am here. He is. And if he can just talk through the next about half a dozen slides, which are on a framework for respect and responsibility. And by providing this framework and with it, the processes that go along with that, we actually provide our students with an ethical basis on how to go through and use these devices. So I'll hand it over to Lee here. So when we first developed the, the very first uh, Global Digital Citizenship Agreement, that was back at Andrews School uh, almost Oh, almost 17 years ago. It was the first school in the Southern Hemisphere to move to a one-to-one -one computing uh, system. And what we did is we eliminated the uh, typical acceptable use agreements that you find in most schools, which are a list of thou shalt nots. You know, thou shalt not do this, thou shalt not do that, and you, you won't do this either. Uh, and then each year those things get uh, adjusted and, and uh, you know, a, a, another dot point gets put in place. And they're, they're essentially agreements that can only be read or understood by a lawyer. Uh, we just replaced that with a very simple um, agreement, which was to respect yourself, take responsibility for yourself, do the same for others and the same for property, being both physical and virtual property. And, and that allowed us at the senior school level to have a series of talking points around um, what is acceptable use. And then the language was modified for the, uh, for the middle and for the um, junior school level. Uh, so that we have age appropriate language. And what we found is that that's given us a framework to uh, be able to have conversations with students about about what to do and allow them to make decisions and and, and use these uh, these moments that occur as teachable moments. So uh, Mitch, next slide is um, really breaking down what we mean when we say respect yourself. Um, we're talking about taking res uh, respecting who you are, how you present yourself, what you choose is your identity, uh, what kind of a username you use, what kind of pictures you post of yourselves online, um, these type of things. And, and when, we, when we help students to understand what it is to respect themselves and why it's important to respect themselves, it is a, it's a different uh, perspective than 
approaching the conversation from don't use inappropriate uh, usernames, don't uh, use inappropriate pictures of yourselves. It becomes a conversation around evaluation at the top end of Blooms. So the next slide, Mick, uh, Mitch, is, is on responsibility. So responsibility for yourself is the other thing we're looking for. We're looking for people to say, hey, gosh, if I do something, um, I, you know, it, it, and I put myself at risk, I, it's, that's, that can't be the good thinking. I've got to really be careful what I do uh, and, and be responsible uh, for, for myself because no one else is going to be responsible for you. And cultivating this understanding of respecting yourself and being responsible for yourself is really the foundation of the process. So next slide is respecting for others. And when we when we think about this, it it means to be responsible as far as uh, respecting people online. So I don't know if you've noticed, but um, every review that you see, all you have to do is go into a, any YouTube video and have a look at the comments below just to see how uh, how poorly we behave uh, as as humans when we're put into a forum where where we're not uh, held accountable for for what we say and what we do. Um, it's really critical that we start to think about how do we respect each other um, and, and, and how, do, how do we communicate um, how do we communicate that as well? Then uh, this does include what sites we visit uh, as well as what sites we post on. And the next slide is about taking responsibility for others. So responsibility for others means just just really that um, understanding that that you know if we see something going on, if we see uh, stuff posted that shouldn't be posted, that we really need to take responsibility to 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 make a difference rather than just walking away from things taking responsibility for others, the same kind of behavior that we want to cultivate uh, in the real world. So the next slide is relating to response or respect for property um, and not just physical but intellectual property. It's, it's incredibly important that our learners understand that, um, that, that what you do uh, in the online world and, the, and, and how, you, uh, how you deal with things uh, it has huge repercussions. For example, if your school has a, a policy where if a student was to break into another student's locker and steal something, uh, that that resulted in, in expulsion. What is your what is your understanding of what will happen if a student downloads uh, illegal music or illegal games? It should be the same thing. Theft is theft, and it's it's understanding that what happens in the digital world is the same thing that happens in the real world. Um, the next slide. Uh, really speaks to just that um, about about being responsible for property. So it's respecting property, respecting how you uh, what you do in those online spaces. I don't know if you've noticed, but all, every review of every product is either one star or five stars, um, and and there's never a two star or a three star or any kind of an honest review. It's either they love it or they hate it. That's just not respecting uh, property. That's not respecting. Uh, other other people's spaces. So what this allows us to do is to have a framework for conversations. So if we've agreed to be responsible for ourselves and responsible for others, then when a cell phone rings in class, uh, instead of the conversation being, you know, bring that up here, put it on my desk, you're not allowed to have it, the conversation becomes, hey, you know, everyone's off task now for the next three minutes because of your actions. So are you being responsible for your own learning? And, and does everyone else feel respected here? And that two or three minute teachable conversation uh, is what allows us to shape how we behave with these devices, uh, which is really, really critically important. So I'm gonna pass it back to Andrew uh, now, and I'll just let him know uh, that we do that as, as we move to the next slide. Okay, so are we back and can people hear me? Yes. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, I was just looking back at the chat log and it, it was interesting when I, I read through to Joyce's comment, which is not applicable for me, cool, but my daughter's school has strict rules for not using in class. Um, and I thought it's possibly worthwhile just pausing for a second and stepping back to there. I've got very strict rules about how my students use their phones in class. Um, I have no problem with them having them in the classroom with them, but it comes back to being considerate. It comes back to being responsible um, for how they actually go and use these devices. They often will receive a, a phone call in class, but 
one of the things we've always said right from the start is that actually if you do receive a call, well, you've got no control of it other than you've got it on silent and the expectation is their phones are always on silent mode. But they have to come and ask to actually um, answer the call. And without fail, they will do this. Um, if it's an important call, they'll just come and say, oh, I need to take this and we'll ask if they can be excused for a minute. If it's not an important call, they'll actually just hang up on it. They also use them and they ask permission to go and take photos of the whiteboard. So they'll do their notes. They're actually handwriting all of their notes and then they supplement their notes by dropping in their photo of the whiteboard or because my desks are all whiteboard desks and we write all over these, they'll take photos of these. It becomes a really useful process for them. If we have somebody coming in and um, presenting to the class, which is something we usually do, then often um, the, the students will come along and ask if they can video it. If there's no problem and objection, they'll go through and they'll actually video the, the presentation. If there is, they obviously won't. Um, I see that Joyce has added now, you know, should be turned off and in the locker during the day and not in use at the end of the day. If caught with the phone, it'll be taken off, off them. Um, and multiple infractions lead to a detention. One of the concerns that I always have with these devices, and if I do have someone who's not a, um, applying and behaving appropriately with them, is how do I deal with the student who is distracted by it? Because these phones are now such an integral part of their lives and because they contain so much personal information, and also, in a lot of times, they're incredibly valued, I don't actually ever touch their device. I'll ask them to put it up the front of the room. And without fail, they'll do this. They'll come and they'll plonk it up there. And then they'll pick it up at the end of the period and when they're wandering out. It's not particularly confrontational. They will come along and quite happily do that. And they know, because it's the expectation that's been set right from the start, that if they're mis mucking around, misbehaving with these, then the phone will sit up the front, they'll collect it. It's always a bit of a concern with me when I'm picking up a couple of thousand dollars with the cell phone, that if I pick it up and drop it, who's responsible for it then and who gets to pay for it? So from my perspective, rather than as Joyce has pointed out with her daughter's school, um, I don't confiscate them, I don't touch them. The kids actually do that themselves. If we come back to the, the slide that's here, about success and students and staff and parents. For us to have a successful program, and the success of the program is, if you like, the area of the, the triangle that we have in the middle, we have to have buy-in and engagement from all three sets of stakeholders. The students obviously have to buy into this. The staff have to be our active role models. And the parents need to be aware of what we're doing and start to um, be involved in this too. So actually getting that buy-in is really important. We've got to make sure that when we're actually working and bringing into to play not only our student policies but also our home policies that actually everybody buys into this. If I come back to our chat, Laptops equal harder to police because we can't just take them away. Student gets caught uh, when a student gets caught visiting non-academic sites. Yep, and and this is definitely one of those ones that's uh, a concern for us. How we deal with that? Um, I deal with it because I'm forever moving around my classroom, and. It's part of how I work in a day. I'm lucky enough that I have one of those nice Fitbit watches that tells me how many steps that I do. And in my average teaching day, I will do probably about six or 7,000 steps just walking through my classroom. Um, active supervision, I find actually reduces any opportunity for the, the kids to be off on different tasks, going and mucking around. And also, if with the kids and I'm coming around working with them and answering their questions. So I think part of that comes back to the, the classroom itself 
I'm, I'm always concerned when I walk into a classroom and I see a teacher's desk up the front of the classroom because I find that the teacher's desk in many ways can be the biggest impediment to effective pedagogy. And it certainly is one of the biggest impediments for how we can interact with our students and keep them focused and on task. If we can slide through Mitch to slide 50, a couple more for me, please. The importance of exercise and sleep, because I just want to, I've just had a message through from Lee saying we've got about 10 minutes to go. We might get a chance to come back to there. One of the important things that I like to stress, and, and both Lee and I make a, an emphasis of this, is the importance of exercise and sleep on education. If we click through to the, the next slide, Dr. John Medina in his book, Spark and, sorry, in Brain Rules, is talking, or talks about the brain craving exercise and the, the irony that we've built our classrooms and the cubicles that a lot of people work in for us sitting around for eight hours a day. One of the things that I'm seeing now happening increasingly, and actually two of my principals within the school I'm in are doing is, is they both have standing desks. So the desks are adjustable height because they've recognized that they actually need to keep moving. And this ability to keep moving around and being active is something we need to encourage in our kids because we know that executive function, creativity, and, and just general good health comes from exercise. And there's a huge amount of value in that. We can click on the next slide, Mitch. Ratey and Hagman, who are the authors of Spark, the Science of Exercise and the Brain, talk about in, in their amazing book, and it really is one I would highly recommend, the importance of actually getting our kids out and ourselves exercising enough to sweat four to five times a week. And they have looked clinically and anecdotally and then also applied it into an academic setting by looking at an entire school district of 18,000 students and the value of regular daily exercise in improving test scores plus improving creativity and generally making learning and life healthier has been quite amazing. If it's a little bit ironic that in a lot of schools that um, I know of in New Zealand, in Australia, where I also do some work and lead out some work as well, and I know also sometimes in the States as well, that we're seeing daily exercise, physical education being removed. It's really, really important we get our kids out moving, being active and working out each day. If we click on to the next slide, the Journal of Neuroscience in 2013 also made a really important statement. It said that the sleep is critically important to boost brain cells. We need to have a good amount of sleep. And one of the issues that we actually have with um, the use of technology comes back to what is its impact on sleep? And we know, if we can click on the next slide, from some of the, the research that came out, and this is research that came out in Sweden, that if you have exposure to a smartphone screen late at night, it is going to impact how long it takes you to sleep, how restful your sleep is, and the duration of it as well. So one of the pieces of advice that we um, give to our students here at school and then 
in a broader audience when we get to talk to people is about actually setting those boundaries. And this is, comes back to our digital citizenship about responsibility for yourself and having that half an hour before you go to bed with absolutely no screens. Balancing that up as well with exercise so that we're actually starting to bring everything back together. I guess for both Lee and I, and I know Lee's just disappeared off because apparently he's had a power cut in Vancouver. I've just sent a message through from him. Um, this all comes back to balance. There isn't a right or wrong age for when our kids are using them, these devices. There isn't necessarily a right or wrong way of doing it. But when we're in the classroom, we need to be deliberate and considered in what we're doing. We need to have a degree of balance. We need to have some time that is completely free of these technologies where there's a bit of a digital detoxification. We need to think and consider our amount of sleep and the exposure to these smartphones, not only just the screens is ruining our sleep, but it's also the other stuff that happens, taking those phones, picking them up and putting them outside of our bedrooms is critically important. And we've also got to get our kids up and moving about. One of the techniques that I use at home is a technology stack. And if we can click onto our last slide there, Mitch. Thank you very much. The end of each evening, we collect in all of our devices and they go into a pile. Um, it's actually nowhere near as clean and tidy as that might look because there's cables everywhere because we're charging everything. But that ability to take everything, put it into one spot is really, really helpful. And by tidying them all up, dropping them in there, it does actually ensure that my kids aren't being woken up in the middle of the night by someone sending them a text message. And they're also having that important downtime where there's no screens, there's no bright light in their eyes that's going to affect how they sleep, how long they sleep, and like. The other thing that all of that certainly my family does is we get out and we play sport. And I really encourage that in some form our kids are getting out and doing some exercise. So where are we at the moment? I don't think that banning cell phones is the right question. We actually need to go back right to the start and look at what is it that we want to do. And it's actually about in our use of these technologies being deliberate and considered and using them in a way that is appropriate and beneficial for an educational setting. Thank you very much for listening to me. Um, I'm sorry I can't hear you guys in return, but if you've got any questions, I'll answer them in the chat if you want to post those. Right. So, so this would be a good time. This would be a, a good time to enter questions that you have in the chat, and um, and I might uh, type Andrew a question also. We've had quite a few uh, hardware issues because I just because I just heard uh, Lee has a power failure, and uh, Andrew has no audio, so he can't hear us. But um, so I'm just reading um, a question that Mitch has put through for me, which is, what is the right question? So. We should ban cell phones is not the right question. The right question, I guess, for, for me is, what is the perfect balance that enables us to use the technology and remain healthy, social, interacting individuals? And I'm going to uh, type this to Andrew in a second also, but you know, as I'm listening to Andrew, it seems to me that um, even if that is the one right question, that there's no one right answer. It's something that we have to get all stakeholders involved in. And I'm going to type that to Andrew to see if he uh, wants to elaborate on that. And it looks like Rush raised his hand. So, um, so. Uh, Should it be all the stakeholders answering that question? Absolutely. 
um, one of the things that we did when we actually developed our um, digital citizenship programs and applied them at school was we had focus groups at different year levels and we presented them with uh, digital citizenship agreements and said, what would you change? Um, how, how would you modify it? What are we saying that's reasonable and what are we saying that's unreasonable? We did have one young gentleman who said, I think you should change it so we shouldn't be pirating as much and I'd like to cut down on the amount that I'm pirating movies. Um, that wasn't quite what we were after, but actually mm -hmm. giving them the opportunity to have input was really important. And also being able to discuss this with the parents as well and the wider community. So the more buy-in we, we got, the better and the stronger the agreements became. And it also pulled the carpet out under the kids who said, oh, we didn't actually agree with this. Well, yes, they all did. They all had that opportunity to go through and actually do that. Um, yeah, fascinating. And then um, I guess, you know, you were, you were talking about, and I'm going to have to text this to him because he can't hear me. Um, you know, you were, you were talking about how the, the, the cell phone is, um, uh, is, you know, today is really more powerful than computers were a couple of years ago. Um, so what are some of your favorite activities for uh, using cell I think phones? there's another question coming. So the question Mitch has asked is, what are some of your favorite activities using cell phones with the students? Um, a lot of the time, they're actually using some of those base features, but using them in an appropriate way. I love the fact that more and more we're getting incredibly high quality video coming through. So often we're going to head out and spend some time at a, a factory or a like and actually getting the students to produce their own videos and not having to try and find video cameras for it. They can actually just go ping, here we go, work through with it. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I'm finding um, really, really useful is augmented reality and virtual reality. There's more and more virtual reality applications coming through that are particularly applicable to um, use in the classroom. And a quick search on YouTube will actually pull up a fair number of them. I've managed to, to obtain some relatively nice, comfortable, cheap headsets. So rather than using something like Google Card, which is a great entry level um, point for virtual reality, but it is pretty uncomfortable. By spending about 10 or $15, you can actually get a headset where you can slot in your um, phone and then have it with, with relative comfort to wear. Virtual reality, they, they said there's an increasingly large amount of material being developed for it. And the same for augmented reality, where you're suddenly starting to be able to get overlays coming through. One of the things that my students with, are going to be experimenting with next year is actually augmented reality in the classroom and how they can go through and start looking at an object, having some degree of recognition of what's in there, and then from there, putting in and overlaying different information. The other thing that, that we do as one of our favorite activities is when we have a question tapping into experts. Um, I've got a, a huge range of parents that are accessible and actually getting the students to ring in and then say, okay, you're on speakerphone, mum or dad, we want to talk about X, Y, Z. It really is useful. Mm -hmm. um, it, those, those, those are interesting applications. And you, 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 in talking about augmented reality, um, we're going to have a, a, an interesting thing we're going to be doing this Thanksgiving with augmented reality is uh, we're going to do a um, quest. So I've just got this comment here from Rush. The, the banning cell phone Good. questions is an extreme. Absolutely agree with you, especially since we agreed that a cell phone is just a mini computer and no one is planning of proposing to ban computers from the classroom. Well, you would hope not, though in some cases, some people are going along and saying, well, we shouldn't have any level of exposure to kids who are under 10 years old. Um, so at schools, the limiting factor seems to really be the teacher's ability to put technology to a legitimate good use. Um, and at home, yet. 
I, I agree with that actually is probably the, the nub of what we're talking about here is that we need to be as educators deliberate and considered in what we are doing and why we are doing it. And I don't know that our teachers colleges are training uh, young graduates with enough experience in this. And I'm not sure either that we're actually getting uh, um, that information coming through to our teachers and schools through professional education. I think really the point you've made there is exactly the the critical fact that it is the teacher's ability to put the technology to appropriate use um, and to have their own toolkit of really, really useful tools to be able to go and use. Now, Mitch, you were going to mention something about um, quests through augmented reality. Yes. I'll hand it um, over to you. Okay. Well, th thank you. Uh, no, I was just, I was just mentioning we're, um, you know, I, through, uh, through my kids and through some teachers, I, I, um, I looked into an augmented reality program that allows you to create quests. So you create the quest as kind of a uh, quiz where the kids go um, around the school finding different items about either a science project that, the, that they're doing or a book that they're reading, and then they answer questions. And it, it kind of combines the physical because they're doing something with with learning because they're learning about whatever they're doing the quest on. Um, and uh, it's kind of like a whole brain type of learning. So uh, unfortunately, Andrew can't hear, couldn't hear that. Um, so I'm just going to text him. Um, Okay, so um, yeah, and so Andrew, I know you can't hear me, uh, but I do want to thank you. Um, I'm going to actually text you. Is there a closing word that you want to to say? And I'll give you a chance to do that, um, and then uh, and then we'll be back up on uh, the 29th. And uh, the thirtieth, please join us for our next couple sessions, and then we'll be back for a couple sessions in December, and then um, and then of course we have a whole series uh, being planned for the next year. So, um, is there a Andrew. closing word I'd like to say? Um, thank you very much for for joining. Um, it, it's been a pleasure, and hopefully we'll get a chance to chat again. Thank you very much. Okay, and so this is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. Thank you for putting up with all of our technical problems tonight and um, hope to see you at a future event. Uh, take care.